Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Heidi Loney, and I'm the Associate Executive Director for the CIFST. On behalf of the CIFST, welcome to our 2023 Knowledge Bytes biweekly webinar series hosted every other day until May. Actually, uh, this is the second last one. So um, as a reminder, I just want to let everyone know that registration is open for the CIFST Canadian Food Summit in London, Ontario from June 7th to 9th, you can find the full schedule of speakers on the website. And now today's topic is Canadian fruit and vegetable byproducts available for use in food product and ingredient manufacturing, an opportunity for upcycling, cost cutting and sustainability. And today our speaker is Alexandra Grigorchik, <laughs> I I was worried that I was going to butcher your name. Okay. Uh, she's a research scientist, sensory and consumer service Vineland Research at the, sorry, at the Vineland Research and Innovation Center. Welcome, Alexandra. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. And now, everyone, before we get to the to Alexandra's presentation, if you have any questions for, for her, you can leave them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and enter your question. And then we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. So Alexander, if you're all set to go, I'm going to hand the reins over to you. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. I'll see you in a bit. Okay. So first of all, I want to say a big thank you to CIFST for the opportunity. So I've been at Vineland for over 10 years now, but I started off my, uh, my career, I guess, in I do my undergrad and my master's in food science at McGill University. And then I did my PhD also in food science at uh, University of Guelph. And so I've been at Vineland for about 10 years. And in that time, I've uh, gotten quite accustomed to being surrounded by plant scientists and agronomists and always being outnumbered. And so I really uh, love those opportunities. I get to be around uh, food industry people again. And so to start off with some background about Vineland, we're a Canadian organization that's dedicated to applied science and innovation. And so we tend to sit in that space that falls between um, upstream uh, academic research and industry. So we work with a lot of companies that are trying to bring uh, new products to market and help them get those uh, products or technologies closer to commercialization. And being in horticulture, the way I like to describe what we do is uh, and how horticulture is different from uh, big ag or big acre crops is that uh, the crops that we focus on are the colorful ones. So fruits, vegetables, ornamental plants like uh, flowers and trees. We also work on related products. So anything that involves fruits and vegetables like plant-based uh, food ingredients or cannabis, wine, cider, as well as any inputs that are used for growing plants like growing media or biofertilizers. We're an independent organization, so that means we're not academic, we're also not government, and we're also not industry. So we sit somewhere in between those three categories. We do a lot of uh, collaborative and multidisciplinary research projects, but because we're um, a very industry-driven organization, all of the work that we do is always in partnership with an industry partner. And so we do grant-funded research as well as about, uh, you know, half 50-50 grant-funded research as well as contract services. And so although we are a not-for-profit, uh, we also do contract services to help balance the books. And we have around 100 employees on our 220 or so acre campus. And we call it campus because we have uh, this large acres of land. And those include 35 buildings that have research labs, farms, and greenhouses where we do a lot of our work and technology validation. We have uh, five different uh, main areas of R&D, and those include our plant variety development team. And so they develop new cultivars of various crops like better tasting apples or better tasting tomatoes. Our automation team works on developing automation systems for the horticulture industry, and also testing different technologies like lighting systems or uh, vertical farming technologies uh, for the horticulture sector. We have our biological crop protection team that works on uh, developing ways to, to protect crops from diseases and pests uh, using non-chemical methods. We also have our um, plant responses and the environment group. And so uh, as the name implies, uh, they look at how plants respond to their environment, whether that's the lighting conditions or soil health or other factors. And then finally, the group that I'm part of is the consumer sensory and market insights team. 
And so uh, within our team, we do consumer research. So for example, online surveys and focus groups and consumer taste evaluations. We also have a trained sensory panel. That's a picture of our uh, sensory lab that we have on campus. And also do market uh, intelligence and business intelligence. So for example, things like competitor analyses and um, cost of production analyses. And so all of this, uh, these types of uh, work that we do uh, is involved at uh, different stages of um, product development for the horticulture sector or anywhere in, along the value chain. And so the reason why I'm talking about waste valorization today is because, um, as I mentioned, we're an industry-driven organization. And so we've noticed that over the past several years, we've had more and more of our industry uh, partners approaching us to do projects that have to do with diverting waste streams or converting them to value-added products. And so we've had a, a growing number of projects on this topic. So as a, a few examples, we've done work around doing sector overviews that look at what are the various sources of waste streams along a value chain and what are the opportunities to use them. We've also worked on ingredients. For example, uh, we were approached by an, an apple processor who had lots of apple pumice and they're looking for an idea for, because they want to make dried apple pumice powder, but they knew there's already other ones in the market. So they wanted to work with us to figure out how can they give their apple pumice powder some kind of value proposition that's different from the ones that are already on the market. And so in this space, we do a lot of um, work around some biochemistry, for example, testing enzyme activities or uh, sensory testing or testing performance of different products. I've also done uh, several contract service projects where we act as a connector. And so we've worked with companies that have a concept for uh, an upcycled product in mind, but they weren't sure where to get their waste streams from and uh, or even which waste streams would be suitable for their concept. And so we worked with them and reached out through our network of contacts to help them figure out uh, which waste streams are available that match their criteria and then also make those business connections for them to set them up with suppliers and uh, secondary processors that can get them the product in the format that they need. And then finally, we've also worked uh, with on the other side of the value chains, the beginning side with uh, growers and um, processors that have uh, that generate byproducts and helping them identify options for repurposing their waste streams. We've also done quite a bit of work on non-food, but specifically most of our non-food works uh, focuses around growing media and how uh, byproduct streams can be converted to growing media. Uh, for example, looking at the quality of the, of the growing media uh, that's generated from different byproducts and how they can be marketed to, as different uh, for, for different crop types, the application rates should be, and, and so on. And we also worked with a couple of biodigesters or, or companies that have biodigesters on site uh, to help them figure out what they can do with the liquid and solid material that gets left behind after biodigestion, uh, because that material can also be used as uh, a biofertilizer. So that's uh, how we're involved in waste conversion. Uh, but I'm going to spend a bit of time talking more generally about upcycled foods. And I won't talk too much about the background of upcycling because I know CIFSC has already had a number of uh, webinars on this topic and that people have uh, taken time to dive into this topic in more detail. Uh, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm going to just uh, mention a few uh, you know, high level uh, points. There's an organization called the Upcycled Food Association, and they were launched in uh, 2019, so they're fairly new, but they do have presence in the US and in Canada, and they already have uh, over 200 uh, members in, uh, that are, have Upcycle certified products. And they certify products as uh, being having verified upcycled ingredients. And so the way that they define upcycled ingredients is that they're ingredients that otherwise would not have gone to human consumption. And products that contain 10% or more of these ingredients can be certified as upcycled products. And so just to give some examples. Um, so if someone was using an ingredient that was sourced from, uh, for example, uh, potato peels, and those potato peels, if they hadn't been using them, they would have been going to animal feed, even though animal feed isn't technically waste, it's not landfilling, uh, because now you're retaining those, those potato peels within a human food value chain, that's considered upcycling. However, if you were using um, apple grayed outs, apple seconds, and if you weren't using those apple seconds, they would have ended up going to the apple juice um, industry. That's not considered upcycling because 
whether you were using those apple seconds or not, uh, they would have still re been retained in the human food value chain. So that's, so that's a few important distinctions. There's a lot of benefits to upcycling uh, products because, of course, there's the sustainability uh, point. There's also an issue of food security because you're retaining more food within the human food value chain and preventing food loss. And sometimes you can also have cost savings. And I say sometimes because even though your raw materials are generally inexpensive because they're byproducts or co-products, uh, but sometimes depending on how you have to transport them or process them, uh, they may not always end up being um, a low cost uh, end product. And these upcycled products are increasing in popularity because there's this increased focus on the circular economy and greenhouse gas emissions reduction. And if organic waste ends up in landfills, as it degrades in an anaerobic environment, it releases um, a lot of methane, which is, very, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. And so because of this, uh, more and more jurisdictions across Canada are banning landfilling of organics. And so uh, companies that are, you know, generate a lot of organic waste are now increasingly under pressure to find alternatives for what to do with that organic waste to avoid landfilling because uh, that's not going to be an option in the coming years for in some areas. And a lot of companies are jumping on board and uh, getting involved in upcycling. So here's a few examples. These lists aren't exhaustive, of course, but just uh, a few examples. So for ingredient companies, companies like Kerry, IFF, uh, Barry Calibo, Ingredion. So a lot of very recognizable names have recently, in just the last couple of years, released either an upcycled ingredient or some of them have even released a whole line of upcycled ingredients. There's also lots of CPGs that have jumped in on, on in this space. Uh, Ocean Spray recently released uh, cranberry seeds, which are marketed very similarly to chia seeds. So that's something that you can top, uh, use as a topper in on your breakfast for your yogurt. Um, and then Del Monte released a line of uh, fruit cups that use upcycled pineapple juice. And since pineapple juice previously was discarded, it came from their processing lines. Uh, and now they found a way to recapture it and uh, in, include it in upcycled fruit cups. There's companies like uh, Remix Snacks and Riverside Naturals that make the Made Good bars and also Bean Bark from Remix Snacks. These are Canadian companies. And I'm sure you've seen these at Sobeys or uh, at Loblaw stores, maybe even Costco. Um, and pasta is also interesting because they make a, a gluten-free pasta option that's made from uh, spaghetti squash. And although they're an American company, they actually source their spaghetti, spaghetti squash from Ontario. And again, those ones I've seen at uh, my local Costco. And upcycling generally is very much aligned with Canadian interests. You know, broadly speaking, Canada is a net exporter of raw agricultural goods, but we're a net importer of processed agricultural goods. And so what that means is that we grow a lot of crops and we sell them to countries like the US, then we buy them back at a higher cost once they've been processed into value added products. And so obviously that's a very uh, significant missed economic opportunity. We have all the raw material here. We have a lot of very skilled people here, uh, but for various reasons, our processing industry isn't quite as developed as it is in other, other countries. And so the Canadian government has recognized this issue and they're trying to make change. And so uh, converting food waste into uh, value added products meets uh, you know, various very important environmental but also economic government objectives including waste reduction, carbon capture, but also expanding the Canadian bioeconomy. And so because the Canadian government wants to grow the bioeconomy, they've also been making investments. So some of you might be familiar with BIC, uh, Bioindustrial Innovation Canada and CIFIN, the Canadian Food Innovation Network. Those are two organizations that were uh, founded in the last few years with investment from the Canadian government. And their, their mission is to help support the growth of Canada's bioprocessing industry. There's also more funding coming available for processors to support their R&D. For example, CAP, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with the CAP program. It's the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. And for many, many years, uh, they've been providing funding uh, for, uh, to develop uh, research projects that support the agriculture sector. And for a long time, that funding was specifically only for on-farm research. And as of this last founding rounds, which, which is this year, so 2023, 
they officially opened up that uh, funding stream to also include uh, research topics that are relevant to the food processing industry. Okay, so now we'll get to the core of the presentation, which is all about um, what kind of byproducts are you know, available in Canada for use in upcycling. In 2022, so last year, we released a report that details the byproducts that are available from the top seven Canadian fruit and vegetable crops, and that's the top seven by production volume. This work was funded by the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and as part of the study, we interviewed more than 40 growers, processors, distributors, and also CPGs uh, from across Canada to understand where the fruits and vegetable waste is happening across the value chain before uh, those products reach retail stores. And so if you're interested in reading the full report, it's available for free on our website. There's a QR code here. They can probably scan with your phone or otherwise you can also just Google buy products and buy land and I'm sure it'll, it'll come up. So starting with potatoes, uh, potatoes are the crop that's grown in the highest volumes in Canada. And it's, they're grown in pretty well every province in various amounts. And what's, what I thought was interesting was that, um, you know, as Canadians, we mostly associate potato production with Atlantic Canada. Uh, but in actuality, in the last few years, Saskatchewan and Manitoba each have actually produced more potatoes than any one of the Atlantic provinces. Uh, although New Brunswick is a close third. <laughs> and so uh, for various reasons, I'm not gonna go into right now, but they're, they're all in the report if you're interested. And there's actually more uh, waste streams from potatoes available from Manitoba and Saskatchewan. And a typical large French processing French fry processing facility, of which there's you know several across the country, uh, will generate around 32,000 tons annually of potato peels. And in the prairie provinces, those potato peels generally go to animal feed. And depending on the relationship that the processor has with the farm, in some cases, the farmer will pay for the transport costs, but in other cases, it's the processor that not only is giving away this material for free, they're also paying for, for transport costs. So it's actually a cost to them to give this away. Uh, some facilities also have potato bits and pieces that are available, and that depends on the facility because uh, if a processing facility has a foreign product line in the same uh, facility, for example, um, hash browns or the smiley face potato um, formed potato products. And then the uh, extra potato bits and pieces that come, come from uh, potato chip manufacturing or french fry manuf manufacturing will go towards that form product line. If the facility does not have a form product line uh, in this, at the same facility, then all those bits and pieces get discarded and sent to animal feed along with the potato peels. And potatoes have lots of you know, really valuable components, like of course starch is probably the most obvious one, but they also have potato protein. Uh, I know uh, potato protein has been quite popular in the last few years in, uh, among product developers around plant-based foods especially, and uh, gallic acid, is, which is an antioxidant in potatoes. Apple pumice is another major source of byproducts in uh, the fruit and vegetable industry. Uh, so apple pumice is what's left, left over uh, in apple juice processing when apples are pressed to make juice. And so it includes uh, skins, the, the apple pulp, uh, seeds, and uh, apple juicing is occurring uh, right across the country. You know, in Atlantic Canada, there's some apple juice manufacturing facilities or cider manufacturers as well. Uh, but the vast majority, uh, the biggest production volumes are in Ontario and Quebec, and uh, a more distant third in British Columbia. And a large processor will generate around 2,000 tons annually from a single facility. And a mid-sized processor will generate around 454 tons of apple pumice annually. And apple pumice contains pectin, carotenoids, anthocyanins. Um, and because it's actually such a high source of pectin, in a lot of other countries, apple pumice is used for pectin extraction. And so if you ever, if you've ever used apple pectin, uh, that's always derived from apple pumice. But as far as I know, there's no uh, companies in Canada that, that are extracting pectin from uh, local uh, apple pumice sources. Uh, for companies that are uh, making juice uh, that's clarified, so not apple cider, but the clarified apple juice, 
uh, after juice pressing, the juice is filtered to remove uh, all the cloudy material or all the material that makes the juice cloudy. So like the polyphenols and, and the pectins, all kinds of other uh, materials and fibers. And all of those materials um, end up making this uh, apple juice filtration retentate which has the consistency of, of like a sludge. And all of that material uh, is generally dumped into wastewater treatment. And so a mid-sized processor will generate around 2 million liters of that annually. And so I'm sure a large processor generates you know, far more than that. And as far as I know, nobody across the country is making use of this material. And so the greenhouse sector uh, is very concentrated in one part of the country. Uh, about 9% of the greenhouse production in Canada takes place in, that, in around Leamington, Leamington, Kingsville area. So that's where the arrow was pointing to on the map. So it's, uh, you know, one county, Essex County, and that has, you know, a, a whole ton of greenhouse production. And greenhouse vegetables include, uh, if you see any tomatoes on the vine in your grocery stores, those are all producing greenhouses, as are the cocktail tomatoes, cherry, grape tomatoes, all the long English cucumbers and the mini cukes are also uh, greenhouse grown. And same with pretty much all the bell peppers that we see in our, in our grocery stores. And beefsteak and Roma tomatoes, this, those could be either uh, greenhouse grown or field grown, so they could be imported. Uh, however, what's interesting about this industry is that whereas for most other crops, uh, a lot of the crop can either go to the fresh market, so to grocery stores, and they also have a processing industry that they can send uh, crops to. And so especially, uh, for example, in apples, all the best looking ones go to the, to the grocery stores. And then apple seconds or thirds, uh, those are generally sent to processing. But the greenhouse sector doesn't have uh, in, any processing sector set up uh, that would receive their, their, all the greenhouse seconds. And so all the, you know, the food service industry will accept some that are not 100% perfect looking, uh, but they also have certain limits because they're, they're still eaten fresh, uh, even if they're in a pre-chopped salad or pre-chopped slices for, for like sandwiches. And so there's still a lot of seconds that uh, don't make the cut. And all of those seconds that are still very much edible, but not, maybe, not, maybe they're overripe or they're mishappened, they have blotchy ripening, like the one in the picture here. Uh, all of that goes to landfill. Uh, or either landfill for the most part in Leamington, uh, or they're left out in a big pile outside of the greenhouse to, to rot away. And in the Leamington area, uh, annually, we estimate there's around 6,800 tons of greenhouse tomatoes uh, seconds that are edible, that are landfilled every year. Around 5,000 tons of greenhouse cucumbers, and as well as you know, large volumes of, of bell peppers. However, we didn't estimate the volumes of bell peppers because those were outside of the scope of the top seven uh, crops that we were looking at. And tomatoes contain cutin. Uh, they also contain lots of uh, antioxidants and colors like beta carotene, lycopene, lutein. And tomato seeds uh, contain uh, you know, protein as there are some commercial tomato seed protein uh, powders in the market, uh, however, not from Canada. Um, onions are also within the top seven uh, crops that are produced in Canada. And the majority of production, again, is in Ontario and Quebec. There's uh, lots of whole onion grade outs that don't have a market for them. For example, if onions are too small or if they have mechanical damage or de they're deformed, then they're not used in either processing or for the fresh market. And we estimate there's around 2,700 tons of these kinds of onions that are still edible but not uh, being used for anything. There's also onion processing byproduct waste. So when processors process onions either for onion rings or uh, chopped and frozen, they always remove the tops, tails, hearts, and skins of the onions. And typically they first uh, press all of those solids to remove the juices. And that way the transport costs are, are lower. And I know, for example, uh, one, uh, one of the companies that's in Ontario, they sell that juice to an ingredient company that sells it uh, to their customers as a flavorant. But all of those solids, they send those to a biodigester and they have to actually pay the biodigester to accept those onion solids. And a large processing facility will generate around 3,600 tons of this uh, onion solid material. There's also carrots and squash. Um, and during processing, 
uh, for, for chopping, you know, if they're chopping and freezing them, uh, they, all those bits and pieces get left behind. And a large processing facility would generate around uh, over a thousand tons annually. And there's several of those large processors, both in Ontario and Quebec. Um, there's carrot peels available, and, but peels are generally peeled by uh, steam peeling. And so what gets left behind is this kind of sludgy material that's uh, kind of liquidy, has lots of uh, carrot fibers in it. And that is uh, discarded at the, at the present moment. And for squash, there's also, in addition to the bits and pieces, there's also pulp and seeds, which is what I have in the picture in the top right. And about uh, 20 tons are available annually of that material. And those uh, squash seeds are, you know, are kind of an interesting uh, potential because you know, they could be used, dried and used as a snack or as a salad topper. They also contain hydrocolloids that could be extracted. Uh, there's also uh, sweet corn juice. There's a, quite a bit of uh, sweet corn grown in Ontario. And a lot of that sweet corn is then uh, removed from the cob and frozen. And the leftover solids, the, the chopped little bits and pieces, uh, or corn cobs, all of that usually is usually given to animal feed. But before it goes to animal feed, uh, it's pressed first to remove the juices, make it as dry as possible for the animals. Uh, but all the leftover juice uh, gets left behind and there's currently no market for it. And so, uh, you know, currently companies, uh, so in Ontario, the major processor, they, uh, right now they spray it over a field, but for various logistical reasons, they would rather find, um, you know, other alternatives. And they have you know, very high volumes of this material. They have around 60 million liters annually. And sweet corn juice, you know, it's sweet because it comes from sweet corn. So it has sugars, it also has cornstarch, it has lutein, uh, zane protein. There's also uh, sweet potato uh, processing uh, in Atlantic Canada, but also in Ontario. And they generate peels and slivers uh, of sweet potato that doesn't make it into the fries. And they have uh, also, uh, sorry, sweet potato peels, which are removed by abrasion peeling. So that's a dry material. There's about 340 tons annually uh, of peels and slivers that are available for sweet potato, which are currently going to biofuel, but could definitely be used in the food, in the food industry. And so that's all the ones I'm gonna talk about for today. But if there's any other relations that you're interested in, uh, you're, you're welcome to reach out and ask because there's other ones that I'm you know, aware of that I haven't mentioned in the presentation. You know, for example, there's a lot of bean canning uh, companies around here that uh, all of them, uh, the water that's left behind, the aquafaba, that's very well known for having foaming abilities, uh, that also gets uh, dumped into wastewater treatment, but definitely has lots of potential. So now how do we actually use these byproducts? And there's, you know, there's certain challenges and opportunities that are involved uh, in trying to upcycle these waste streams. There's various material challenges. You know, of course, because it's fruits and vegetables, they're high in moisture content. So that uh, it will impact your transport costs. It also means there's a low concentration of compounds of interest and drying takes time and it takes energy. They're also highly perishable especially once they're cut or peeled. So if you're getting your material from a processor, you have to find a way to stabilize them. But a lot of these processors also have freezing abilities. So they could freeze it for you and, and provide it to you that way. And so you often have less than 24 hours uh, to use the material or stabilize it in some way before the quality substantially degrades. And so the key to using this material is to really think local, either process on site, you can develop a relationship with the byproduct generator and maybe uh, have uh, some processing equipment installed on site or within a reasonable driving distance. You have to also stabilize them as quickly as possible by drying, freezing, or cooking. And you can consider reducing moisture, again, to reduce those transport costs. There's also a number of um, supplier challenges. So many of the processing facilities, when they were built, they were not designed with byproduct value retention in mind. And so when they have processing happening, uh, the waste streams from all the processing, like the offcuts and the, and the peels, a lot of them are conveyed into a single conveyor belt. And so if you have multiple processing lines processing different products, the waste streams from those different lines go in the same place. And that can change from week to week, depending on what they're processing that particular week. Uh, but also it may not be food grade because if they're mixing it with those early stages, uh, early stage waste streams from the washing step, 
then it might also have uh, some soil or some stones mixed in there. However, and that's a big however, um, many of the processors we spoke with, uh, they are willing to reconfigure their lines if they have a, a buyer lined up. And so just because their wishes are not separated now, it doesn't mean they can't be. And so if there's a wishes that you're interested in uh, from a local processor, it's worth starting the conversation with them early. That way they have time to make those changes to their, to their production facility that, so they can supply you with that waste stream when you're ready to go to market. And these waste streams, you know, they have, they're just full of different, you know, very valuable components. Of course, there are all sources of fiber. And so that makes them good bulking agents. Especially pumice and peels are very high in fiber. Uh, some of them contain complex carbohydrates of interest, like apple pectin or potato starch. So that can play a role in thickening and water binding. Some of them are also surprisingly high in protein, like uh, potatoes are fairly high in protein. As I've already mentioned, potato proteins as being pretty popular in the last few years. There's uh, tomato seeds. I haven't, I didn't talk in the presentation today about the tomato processing industry. Uh, that's a, a separate industry, but also in the top seven crops. It's all about, uh, it's all in the report. Uh, but tomato seeds uh, are of interest because they are high in protein. And uh, cucumber peels are also high in protein. So actually, the report that I referenced previously, we have a table in the report that shows the composition of all of these different waste streams, like the main uh, protein content uh, and uh, fat content and so on. So potatoes, uh, sorry, cucumbers are kind of interesting because they're surprisingly high in protein, but I haven't been able to find any research that even examined the protein, um, the proteins in cucumbers for their uh, food relevance, including green relevance. There's definitely no commercially available cucumber protein powders on the market right now. And proteins are great because they have emulsifying properties, foaming and texturizing abilities. Uh, next, we also have the most famous components of fruits and vegetables, which is their pigments and antioxidants. So they can contribute to color and shelf life extension because uh, those antioxidants can well delay oxidation. Uh, but they also, many of them have uh, antimicrobial properties and could potentially be used as uh, clean label um, uh, preservatives. They also have a number of other uh, components in various waste streams like waxes and vitamins and minerals and flavors. And a lot of them could be used as biomass, uh, starting biomass for fermentation. So to show some of the ways that these waste streams could potentially be used as ingredients, I included just a couple of examples of uh, some of the work that we've done at Vineland that looked at the value proposition or, or function of these byproducts in food formulations. And um, so Heidi had previously mentioned my colleague who's gonna be speaking at the CIFST conference. And that's about uh, this work about apple pumice powder, where uh, apple pumice powder is currently limited to mostly use in products that have some inherent coarseness like uh, brown muffins or sausages because the powder generally has a fairly large particle size. And so if you try to add it to a smooth product like yogurt, it uh, impacts the, the grittiness, grittiness perception. And so we did some work to see if we could avoid that by reducing the particle size further and how much you have to do reduce the particle size to be able to use it in a fruit uh, filling for yogurt. And so we were successful in doing that. And, you, and we ended up using the apple pumice instead of pectin uh, as the thickener in a fruit filling that we then added to yogurt. And so I'm not gonna talk about this in detail because again, if you would like, you can see it at the CIFST conference. Uh, but it is possible to extend the use of apple pumice powder in uh, smooth products. Uh, through other work that we did, we also discovered the presence of an enzyme that has food industry relevance in a very wide range of Canadian fruit and vegetable byproducts. And so we're planning to continue that work in the coming uh, year to look at how fruit and vegetable products can be used for their enzyme activity uh, without having to actually extract those enzymes. So by using the whole um, dried material, uh, you know, if there's potential to use that uh, to have um, impacts on, uh, on food, uh, food formulations. So before I wrap up, I wanted to just include a couple of slides with some advice on uh, upcycling. So firstly, to have a successful obstacle product, the key is to maintain a balance because the obstacle status is a good thing, it's a plus, but on its own, it's typically not enough to make an ingredient or a product a success. 
they, these upcycling bins also have to have function and, and meet cost expectations. So in some cases, depending on what you're doing with it, if you uh, have limited transport costs or you process in an inefficient way, you could end up with an obstacle ingredient that is um, lower cost than whatever other ingredient you're trying to replace. But that's not always going to be the case. And so if your cost is similar to, or you know, maybe even a little bit higher than alternative ingredients, you have to really make sure that it stands out in other ways. For example, you know, having you know, very useful um, properties like water holding capacity and thickening capacity and that it meets sensory expectations because if it does those things and it's also clean label and it's not an allergen and all of the crops I talked about today are also non-GMO. And so all of those things can make it stand out and make it competitive in the market. And if you're looking to get into this space, there is an existing support network available to help you get there. There's more and more funding becoming available for uh, product, projects that are looking at developing upcycled ingredients or products. For example, the Canadian Food Innovation Network has lots of uh, funding, different funding programs. Agriculture and Agri Food Canada, I already mentioned the Sustainable Cap Program. And Natural Products Canada, Coil, Bio Enterprise, and IRAP all have uh, different types of funding available. There's also R&D support available, uh, obviously from Vineland, but also from universities. For example, University of Guelph, Laval, and Simon Fraser, they all have uh, R&D services available and pilot plants uh, out of their food science departments. The Alberta Food Processing Center also has a pilot plant and, and R&D capabilities, as well as many colleges across the country that can support R&D. Uh, there's also a number of business consulting firms that specialize in sustainability and waste reduction, like VCM International and Anthesis Coalition, that can help with establishing sustainability goals and a um, roadmap to how to reach them. And if you're looking for inspiration, there's also lots of different Canadian upcycled food examples that you can turn to. Uh, for example, I already, I already mentioned Remix Snacks, Outcast Foods. There's also Loop and Still Good and Big Mountain Foods, and lots and lots more. So again, these lists are not exhaustive, but just to give an example of the fact that there is a pretty extensive support network available. So to finish up, uh, I'll just say that there's a growing interest in upcycled products and ingredients. And Canada clearly has large volumes of underutilized fruits and vegetables available. And there's a great deal of opportunity here. So there's more and more technologies being developed and more funding opportunities and business support that's available for companies that are interested in uh, growing in this space. So thank you. I have my contact information here. So if you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to reach out to me. Hi, Alexander. Thank you so much. That was so like, uh... I'm very easy to understand. Like, so even someone like me who is layman person, uh, I found it very fascinating, really easy to understand. Thank you so much. Um, it's sort of like, it seems sort of unfortunate that Canada, like, you know, we, we grow so much, uh, we're known mm -hmm. throughout the world and yet we, you know, we don't have these processing uh, systems in place. Uh, I have uh, I have one question so far that's come in, but if anybody has any questions for Alexandra, feel free to put it in the Q&A box and we will ask her. Uh, so one that comes from Brad McKay, he's like a, a past president, Brad McKay, he's asking, I am glancing at the report as you speak, like the one that you just referenced, does the report have or can you release specific names and locations of this facility so we can contact them? Uh, so I had promised interviews, I wouldn't include their names in the report, but if sure. you reach out to me, I'm happy to make some of those connections for you. Okay, so Brad, you know what I can do after all, uh, I'll introduce you to Alexandra and uh uh, send your email. Uh, one of the things I was wondering, like regarding the processing, uh, if, if these some of these companies have to do some adaptation or you know uh, rejig how they work, are there grants that are available to them? Uh, will they will the government, local governments, like or other funding is is it available to help these processors change over? Yes, yeah, so, I mean the funding. What's available always changes with time. I think what kind of funding calls are coming out, but definitely yes. Actually, in the CIFST food cluster, uh, that that we you know we have an application in there. One of those yes. uh, involves working with a processor who would like to make some of those changes. And the what's in the grants is looking at uh, you know those engineering uh, 
estimates of what it would take to make those, those changes. There's also funding available from uh, the Canadian Food and Innovation Network, CFIN, that does allow um, capital costs as one of their eligible costs, depending on yeah. the program. Yeah, and it's funny because next week, or sorry, in two weeks, we have someone from CFIN coming to speak to us about uh, plastic, <laughs> plastic reduction. So that's perfect. That ties in nicely. Oh, we've got another question here. Uh, so uh, it's G. Villette asks, sorry if I'm butchering her name, for vegetable peels, how to make sure they are not contaminated in mm -hmm. pesticide? That's a great question. Yeah. So when uh, fruits and vegetables are grown, uh, before they're harvested, there's always a certain... Um, what is the term? There's an official, there's a formal term that I'm forgetting right now, but it's also, a, it's always a delay period before I, that states how long before harvest they have to be, they cannot be sprayed before harvest. So I'm not explaining that very well, but there's always a delay period that's like on the label that's heavily regulated by, by health, uh, by CFIA. And so by the time they're harvested, they have to already be at a point where those pesticides will not be uh, a risk to human health. And they're usually grown uh, with the, you know, assumption that they're going to the food industry, they're going for, you know, human consumption. And so that's something that you can also get more details about from the, 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 the manufacturer or the grower. But generally, that's not much of a concern. Yeah, and you were and you were also speaking a lot about the greenhouse, uh, the greenhouse vegetables and fruits, which mm -hmm. I I love. I buy a lot of those mm -hmm. myself. Um, they I don't think that they are sprayed with pesticide, if I understand. Uh, minimally, so they only minimally. So okay, for, for the most part, greenhouses use um, uh, it's called uh, integrated pest management (IPM) practices. So, for example, they use netting or uh, biocontrol, so they're pest natural predators to prevent uh, the proliferation of pests or diseases in their greenhouses. But occasionally, if they run into a, you know, a problem and they are able to manage with IPM, they might do a, do a bit of spraying, but it's, you know, it depends on the, on the season. Sometimes they get through the whole season without having to use sprays, and sometimes they might have to do a, an intervention, but it is minimal. Especially compared yeah, to Yeah, because uh, I've heard some people like if they have issues with regular tomatoes, for instance, if they buy greenhouse, they tend to, you yeah. know, have less sensitivity. I, that's not, that's completely anecdotal, by the way. There's, there's nothing, there's no science behind what I've just said there. Uh, by the way, Brad says, brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce. So, does anybody else have any questions they have about Alexandra? Um, if not, we can. Uh, let you guys get on with your lunch. Um, but as she was saying, so Amy Blake will be at the conference, which is uh, June 7 to 9. I think she's there on the on the Thursday. I will double check. Brad McKay, who's also just asked you the question, he's also at the conference. So uh, I just wanted to, as I was mentioning, we have CFIN in two weeks coming. So our, it's going to be our last Knowledge Bytes webinar for the spring. And then, you know, we'll co hopefully come back in the fall again. We haven't uh, uh, started working on that yet. So the the topic will be trends influencing sustainable packaging adoption. And our speaker is Jamil Kareem. Uh, he is the Director of Communications at the Canadian Food Innovation Network, CFIN. I think you probably know him. Uh, and registration is now open on our website and it's free for all CFST members. So that date is Wednesday, May 17th at noon. So thank you so much, Alexander, for joining us today. It was just like such a uh, a wonderful, wide opening, like eye opening uh, experience listening to you talk about this. I really hope that uh, you know we'll start to see more of these products on the shelves, like you were saying at Costco or our regular grocery stores. Because um, I, I immediately was thinking about like in the old days, like we would have used everything, like they would have made a potato peel pie or something like that, or they would have made soup stock. We wouldn't have, you know, the, yeah. the idea that it's just being thrown out seems just such a waste to me. Yeah, there's definitely lots of opportunity. Lots <laughs> well, of thanks. There. Sorry, go ahead. I just say there's lots of potential. Absolutely. So I think in the next few years, we're going to see a lot of exciting things happening. So thank you so much again for joining us. And uh, I really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody who attended today. Thank you. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye.